Every time looking at the rising sun, a man hopes in a special way. I mean any person. Even the one for whom the dawn brings death with it. For example, the one sentenced to death. I'm not afraid of death. And it seems to me that, in fact, none of the mortals should fear this natural limit of human existence. Existence, but not life. After all, life does not end with death, but continues in our children, in the humanity, to which we leave our thoughts and deeds. Human death is not terrible, as long as mankind has hope for the future. And this hope for the future of mankind, apparently, opens for everyone at the moment of sunrise. After all, the sun rises for everybody, and at this moment it is possible, as never before, to feel oneself a part of the universal existence, opening to each of us as a hope. And what will happen if the humanity loses hope? We have not so much time left, only some three, four generations, till the point of no return, when the death of the civilization will be impossible to prevent. A long time ago, I was struck by one experiment. Two frogs were thrown into two vessels with water, standing on the fire. In one of them, the water was very hot, almost boiling, and the frog falling into it immediately jumped out getting up with nothing more than a mere fright. In the second one, cold water was gradually heated. The frog felt the discomfort in one place and passed to another, then the third, fourth place in the vessel, and so on until it was boiled alive. Our civilization reminds me of that frog. We feel uncomfortable in one place, we move to another. If we cannot pollute the atmosphere here, we'll do it somewhere else, in another place or even another country. Instead of one source of pollution, we will move on to another. For example, instead of thermal power plant, we will build a nuclear power station. We shall prefer a lesser evil to a greater one, and so on. There are only two possible outcomes from the development of technocratic civilization its death from wastes of industrial technologies or separation of the technosphere from the biosphere, the removal of the Earth's industry into the outer space. I experienced myself the way in which we can die when my home village near Gomel was covered with a cloud of radioactive fallout after the largest technogenic catastrophe in the history of mankind on the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And this is just one power plant, a small industrial cog in a machine for the production of the safest type of energy, electricity. Man has created technology, and the latter has become too strong to be controlled. Chernobyl is a vivid example, a lesson from which we have never made conclusions. Today, there is a lot of talk about environmental pollution, global warming, and the like. Quotas on emissions of certain substances are introduced in some regions. Doesn't it remind you of anything? The frog in the vessel with water, which is hot yet not deadly enough. It's all half measures. We will not achieve anything, just reducing the quantity of emissions or harmful substances in the atmosphere. Thus, you can only postpone death but not avoid it. The only way of salvation for humanity is the removal of hazardous industries from the Earth into the orbit in the near space. It was Tsiolkovsky that stated it long ago. I read his works in my childhood. I understand that we can lose the whole planet in this way. Lose everything because the civilization has done it, this tragedy. It has been done by the safest type of energy, electricity. As the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is an electric power station, it produces the safest and the cleanest electric energy. However, we see that it is not so. It is not safe. It is not clean. Here, I used to walk. I went to that school. This is my classroom. 
I sat here in the sixth form. They taught us many things. They taught well. I received a very good education in this remote rural school among swamps. Classrooms of chemistry and physics must be there. There is no force more powerful than knowledge. Man armed with knowledge is unconquerable. Maxim Gorky Wallpaper, young physicist, issued by the physicist section. There were very good sections. I also attended them. I was fond of rocket modeling. I designed the first rockets here, starting from the second form. It is just a rural school, and they gave us very good knowledge. I remember it with gratitude. The thought of the possibility to remove industries, bringing them out into space, has entirely captured me. I must say that it came at an important time. The outer space was very popular then. Of course, we were ahead of the whole planet, ahead of Americans. However, very soon it became obvious to me that the rocket is neither a means of conquering space nor developing it for industrial purposes. The possibilities of using rockets are very limited. In addition, rockets are environmentally hazardous and very expensive. Each launch may cost hundreds million dollars. Today the cost of shipping one ton of cargo into the orbit 300 kilometers high exceeds 10 million dollars. For space exploration, this cost should be no more than a thousand dollars per ton. That is dozens thousand times cheaper. One heavy rocket makes a hole in the ozone layer the size of France. 100 launches of carrier rockets a year, and it's only a few hundred tons of cargo annually, will completely destroy the ozone layer of the planet. These are the capabilities of the traditional space vehicle called a rocket. On the ground such work can be handled by one cart with a pair of sturdy horses. This is the Tyrrhenian analog of the space transport created by the Earth's civilization. Though it is somewhat more costly, over a trillion dollars, such an amount was spent on the space race over the last 70 years. It is obvious that one earthly car cannot satisfy the transport needs of more than 7 billion people populating our planet. It is also obvious that such transport would not cope with the creation of a space industry servicing the whole humanity. The solution I suggested is the only possible one, a non-rocket space development. It is based on the laws of physics and is very simple in its essence. We can carry to orbit a large number of cargoes, millions of tons and millions of passengers in one trip, using this centrifugal force. To do this, we need to build a ring along the equator that will be a general planetary vehicle. Inside the ring, a flywheel will move on magnetic suspension in a special vacuum channel. It will be accelerated by a linear electric motor on the principle of magnetic levitation trains. Due to this, the ring, increasing in diameter, 
will gradually rise above the Earth until it reaches the required altitude and orbital speed of 8 km per second. Thus, we will be able to bring an unlimited quantity of cargo into the orbit to receive the possibility of using inexhaustible resources of the outer space, raw materials, energy, space, and to save the Earth from the excessive burden of technological operations. Thanks to new technological resources of space, absent on the Earth, zero gravity and deep vacuum, tremendous opportunities will open for the future space industry. Now, it seems even a bit naive, but at that moment I thought that if I told people about my invention, they would understand its importance. I was sure they would hear me. And they did. They called me crazy, paranoid, a dreamer. This too was a kind of recognition. Once they looked in the same way at Noah, who was building his ark. Ideas of Copernicus and Bruno were perceived alike. Even discussing the airplane, the skeptics said that this object is heavier than air and hence it cannot fly, while other experts argued that space travel was impossible in vacuum, because the jet stream would have nothing to push away from. However, there was another recognition, a real one. More than 100 patents and certificates on inventions, publications in scientific journals, and a large scientific monograph. In a sense, I am grateful to those who criticized me. They motivated me to champion the idea, develop, and improve it. Thus, in fact, the concept of the string transport originated. It was the offspring from the overpasses of the general planetary vehicle. The main disadvantage of the initial idea of rocketless space exploration is related to the necessity of an overpass construction, which must encircle the entire globe along the equator. If the overpass is to be built in its traditional design, it would require an unbelievable amount of construction materials. However, the expenses can be significantly reduced if the overpass structure is made of pre-stressed string rails. String cables will bear a considerable portion of the load, due to which bearing structures can be much lighter and, consequently, less material intensive. In addition, such structure is more solid, resistant to external effects, and cheap. Compared to a conventional overpass, it is undoubtedly advantageous in itself, and therefore can replace a conventional overpass not only within the concept of rocketless space exploration, but also in everyday life for construction of earth roads and bridges. It is as if the idea itself is pushing me, suggesting a means for its implementation, which requires great financial costs, and which no state is ready to undertake. At a certain moment I understood that the string system, which I invented, was meant to become a sort of a take-off runway for the general planetary vehicle in two aspects. It is to provide technical implementation of the project and, which is as much or even more important, to ensure its financing. Out of everything invented by myself in relation to the space vehicle, an overpass is the most earthly, understandable and potentially marketable component. It can and must be commercialized, becoming the first step towards saving the planet. I will try to explain. At high-speed movement, 90% of energy and more is required for aerodynamics. There are difficulties associated with the airfoil effect. When a vehicle moves close to the screen, there arises asymmetric airflow and occurs dynamic air discharge under the vehicle. The airfoil effect deteriorates aerodynamic characteristics by at least 2.5 times. With the vehicle uplifted above the ground, by the size of the vehicle, aerodynamic resistance is reduced by the same amount. However, it is required not only to uplift the vehicle above the ground, but to eliminate the screen to introduce two narrow string rails instead of a solid roadbed. A conventional overpass with a solid roadbed and a string overpass are both just overpasses. The Skyway 1 is designed under the same normative standards. However, with the same load and bearing capacity, our string overpass will be at least 20 to 30 times cheaper. Instead of a solid roadbed, there are two narrow rails. It is clear that we need 10 to 20 times less work to assemble the track structure. 
A beam structure is split and its bearing capacity is about five times lower compared to the same overpass but unsplit, without temperature joints. Therefore, we can significantly reduce the material consumption and cost because of replacing a solid roadbed with two narrow string rails. We can also improve track smoothness by five times as the structure is unsplit and free stressed. I still had to solve a problem of overcoming rolling resistance, which requires about 10% of energy consumption at high-speed movement, considering that 90% of energy is consumed by aerodynamics. A Skyway wheel is different, it's not a railway wheel, which is prone to significant rolling resistance. The reason is that a conical wheel rests on a cylindrical railhead. In our case, a cylindrical wheel rests on a flat railhead. Therefore, compared to the railway, we have improved wheel features twofold. In this connection, it needs twofold less power to overcome the rolling resistance. In our case, losses at high speed movement are several times lower than those of a pneumatic tire, asphalt, and concrete roadbed system. Thus, a concept of the optimal overground transport system, later on named Skyway, was created. It represents another overpass. Firstly, it is pre stressed split and statically undetermined. Secondly, we envisage a rail motor vehicle named Unibus moving along our overpass. A Unibus has an exceptionally good aerodynamics. It is equipped with an anti-derailment and intellectual safety control systems for energy supply and communications. And thirdly, our infrastructure is on the second level. It is different. It is located not on the ground surface, but above it. That is why all the infrastructure is different too. Obviously, this system will not solve global problems, but it will allow gaining time by saving trillions of tons of fuel over 100 years and it will prevent trillions of tons of hazardous substances from releasing into the atmosphere. Time is the main resource. And mankind is having less and less of it. I have already said that modern ecology movements with their programs are capable just to delay the destruction of civilization. All of them are like a child game, where the time moves only within the limits set by the rules. However, the present time is above any rules. After we gain time, the most important step must follow. There must be a solution. And I know what the solution is. I know how to gain time for the implementation of the program proposed by myself. String rail transport, which I proposed as the first step, is not only the most effective, but also the safest and the most eco-friendly transport. It becomes especially obvious when using a scale factor. In particular, if in the coming decades we manage to build an alternative world transport and infrastructure network Transnet, this will save about 100 million people's lives before the end of this century. Otherwise, all these people would die in transport disasters and primarily in road accidents. Land users will get back more than five territories of Great Britain. It is exactly the area of soil that is rolled up in asphalt and buried under railway sleepers today. A ten times bigger territory of soil will be saved from ecological degradation. Hundreds of billions of tons of fuel, costing hundreds of trillions of dollars, will be saved. In addition, trillions of tons of atmospheric oxygen, vitally important for our breathing, will not be burned in engines of cars, locomotives and planes. We will be able to breathe longer, we will gain time, we will gain one more dawn and one more hope. I pray to have more time I need to finish what I have started and to accomplish all that's in my power for implementation of the intended, for all the people united by this dawn and the special hope brought by it.
It is with this thought that I have been starting my days for almost 40 years already. It is the time devoted to implementation of the ideas on strain rail transport and rocketless space exploration. I know that I'm not alone and it gives me confidence that I have chosen the right way. A person's life exists only in the life of mankind. I'm supported by those who understand it and the number of my fellow thinkers is increasing. My family, my friends, engineers and designers, people who support the rail stream transport project with their investments, with their aspiration to do everything which depends on them in order to prevent our civilization from the catastrophe and with their faith. Today, we are together building ECHO Technopark, the center for international assessment and certification of the Skyway Transport, where from this innovative solution will be able to make its contribution to the future. Together we're building the future, better than the one which awaits us if no attempts are made right now, when still there is some time left. I'm convinced that as soon as we complete the construction of test sites and certify the Skyway stream rail transport, it will be in demand all over the world. Indeed, the most effective, cheap, eco-friendly and safe transport of all existing at present cannot but be in demand. In addition, Although wealth is not our primary goal, we'll become rich by selling the technology created by ourselves. I'll invest my personal earnings in the development of the Spaceway program. Nobody is ready to finance this program today. Neither Russia with its Roscosmos State Corporation for Space Activities, nor the United States of America with its NASA or the United Nations. Just think that only the research and development works on this program will require about $100 billion of investment. Implementation of the Spaceway program, the cost of which is estimated to be more than a trillion dollars, will provide a transit of the Earth civilization to the new stage of development. It will become a space civilization, where the industry will be taken outside its home, the Earth's biosphere. Our civilization and consequently our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will get unlimited possibilities for further technological development without conflicts between the Earth biosphere created by God and the industrial technosphere created by Homo sapiens.